Greetings from beautiful Los Angeles, California, a city known for being the sphincter through which emanates most of uh, what constitutes modern mainstream American culture. Now, there are a lot nicer places in uh, the city of Los Angeles that I could show you. Some of those places uh, are known for being populated by an elite top tier class of people uh, that uh, enjoy locking themselves in the closet so they can bathe in the ambience of their own farts. You know, some of these people uh, have... Uh, cosmetic surgery, Botox, ass jobs, boob jobs, uh, worth more money than the gross domestic product of uh, some of the nations currently on the world stage. However, I want to show you a side of Los Angeles which uh, warms my heart, which I'm uh, nearer and dearer to than any of those other places. Now, uh, as you can see, we're above the uh, Southern Pacific tracks now owned by Union Pacific, as well as the L.A. River. Uh, now, this uh, river of course has already gone through North Hollywood through which it also runs and by this point it's a little bit wider and a little bit browner probably due to the amount of uh, human shit raw sewage industrial efflu effluent and uh, petrochemicals that now constitute the mass of the flow we're still a couple miles uh, east of the Pacific Ocean through which uh, all this uh, uh, effluent is now headed so uh, anyway we're gonna go down there we're gonna see what's growing down there you know take a look at some of the uh, you know piles of shit and garbage and uh, uh, burnt industrial decay uh, and to me that serves as a nice antidote uh, for when you've had enough of the glitz and the glam and the fancy shit and whatnot so anyway we're gonna take a little walk see what's going on down there here we go anyway here we are uh, beautiful uh, train tracks next to the LA River down on the ground see what's going on you can see there's a bunch of garbage you spray paint cans some bummy camps as well as a headless pigeon and a human turd over there but I want to focus on this plant right here. This is a member of the Euphorbiaceae. Uh, this is Ricinus communis, also known as a castor plant because it's uh, the main source of castor bean, well, it's the only source of castor bean oil. It's also uh, a, a source of ricin, being that castor beans within the, the uh, inner part of the seed uh, contain, a, well, the toxin rice. Remember that scene in the Breaking Bad when uh, Walter White is making a, a poison to kill? I think he did it a couple times. To, uh, to kill uh, one of the, the sketchy drug dealers or the what anyway the point is he uh, gets it from this plant and the little seeds he has are castor beans which again are a part of this plant now this is a very invasive plant that does very well uh, in areas where it's warm enough to grow you see it in Mexico a lot we've seen some down there in Chile and it also uh, seems to thrive uh, along this railroad corridor next to the LA, LA River again Euphorbiaceae is the family poinsettia family it is a rather beautiful plant I believe it's uh, uh, planted uh, ornamentally quite a bit too. You could see the beautiful red color in those leaves just glistening in the morning sun. Uh, looks like a uh, looks like it's cedar that's uh, you know damaged from uh, ozone or uh, nitrogen dioxide, or possibly it could be thrips. Though either way, a very uh, waxy, uh, waxy, uh, leathery leaves kind of feels like wet leather. And again, the seeds are immensely toxic. If you were to eat a couple of these, well, it may not hurt you if your stomach enzymes did not break the seed coat. But if you were to chew on one for a little bit, you know, masticate it a little bit, uh, you'd certainly die, especially if you had more than one. And where you go. Look at a beautiful purple stem on it. Again, Ricinus communis, the castor bean plant, Euphorbiaceae poinsettia family. It, now this is nice to see. It's nice to see a native plant growing amidst the shit and the garbage and the, you know, the industrial decay uh, as well as a, a plant community dominated almost entirely by non-native invasives uh, like this uh, tree tobacco, that Nicotiana species right there. This is Baccarus, uh, probably Salicifolia it looks like. And uh, Baccarus plants of course are in a sunflower family, a family known for its uh, worldwide ecological dominance occurring on every continent save for Antarctica. Uh, these plants uh, are female. Now most members of the sunflower family are bisexual, that is they have both male and female uh, uh, florets on their individual capitulas. It's just an easy way to say it without sounding too, uh, too complicated is that most they most of them got perfect flowers. It is they got male and female parts. Bacchus, however, is notable for for being dioecious, like cannabis usually is. It is plants are either male or female. And right here, you got a female. You can see it's got a discoid flower, no daisy rays. Uh, the common name for this is a willow leaf bacchus because it looks a little bit like a willow, I guess. It looks a little bit like the Pacific willow. 
uh, from a distance. But anyway, you could see you got those nice pink filaries, those roof and shingle brags set in a nice coloration to the flower. And uh, once these are pollinated uh, and the seeds, or the akines rather, akine is just a one seeded fruit, are mature, they get a little dandelion fluff, a little fuzzy dandelion fluff on them that's wind dispersed and then they blow away and uh, you know reseed themselves and start new plants. So each one of these tiny little flowers produces upwards of 25 to 30 akines at least. So you can see why it's so successful you know and it's uh, it's what you would call a weedy native. So normally when you think of weeds you think of non-native invasive shit that outcompetes all the native and forms a monoculture but with baccarus they're just a very aggressive or you could say ecologically successful native plants. So they don't out compete, they don't form monocultures, but they're one of the first uh, plants to recolonize the uh, shitty disturbed areas uh, like this railroad corridor next to the LA River. I just heard the sound of the uh, auto start and stop shut down on those locomotives, which means those poor bastards are gonna be waiting there for uh, upwards of <laughs> at least an hour or so. Uh, how I do not envy them. Anyway, uh, here's a pretty, uh, interesting plant and it's a very uh, invasive plant even though it is kind of gorgeous it can be a real pain in the ass and it occurs all over the world now it's native to uh, south america uh, but uh, like i said it's a roadside weed very common roadside weed aggressive weed in uh, california as well as mexico south america areas of australia and uh, as well as uh, asia basically any place that's warm enough for it to do its thing this is nicotiana glaca it's a true uh, species of tobacco. It's known as the tree tobacco and it contains uh, the alkaloid nicotine uh, which uh, some people are still stupid enough uh, uh, to inhale in vapor form as well as uh, uh, anabasine uh, which is another alkaloid which uh, is in fact deadly. I mean you could die from consuming yes, take a, say you take a wad of these leaves and uh, you know distill them or something or make a tincture like the herbalists do and you, you suck on it for a while you probably die. Uh, Anabasine is also uh, used as an in industrial insecticide. Yeah, you've probably heard of neonics before. Neonics uh, are what's uh, killing the bees as well as uh, many of the insects uh, all over the world. And uh, the neonics are basically synthetic compounds modeled after many of the naturally occurring alkaloids uh, that occur in many of the uh, uh, nicotine, nicotiana species. Nicotiana does have uh, some uh, California native members such as Obtusifolia which you'll see in the Mojave deserts uh, but uh, you know it's, it's one of those nightshades this Solanaceae family immensely successful family with very species rich in South America I mean down in Chile you got all kinds of interesting members of this family doing their thing you know you got the true Solanums down there they got yellow flowers they're actually relatives of tomatoes, close relatives of tomatoes. You also got the uh, Nolanas down there in Chile, very successful uh, desert member of the nightshade family. It's a wonderful family. Oh, Datura, you know, and uh, Brugmansia. The, the Brugmansias look like Datura, but they're dangling ones. The Mexican grannies like uh, planting the Brugmansias in their yard. Datura, you got a native member of that that grows in the Mojave. You know, very beautiful plants, but oftentimes they're very toxic and they contain a wealth of... Uh, very toxic uh, alkaloids as well as uh, many other uh, secondary metabolites and compounds. Anyway, there you go, Nicotiana Glaca. Looks like that engine's starting up. Maybe these poor bastards are actually getting out of here. Yeah, you know, I know what you do when you look at me like that, you know? I know you're enjoying your time in the sun right now, but you know you're getting a bath later on, especially after some of the shit we've been walking through. Anyway, here's another, uh, another botanical bastard, <laughs> another photosynthetic blight. Uh, this one, again, is uh, gorgeous, but it just escapes cultivation, goes wild, and it tends to run rampant on the landscape of Southern California, much to the detriment of the uh, native plant community. This is Penicetum cetaceum, also known as fountain grass. Okay, had to wait for that train to leave. It started moving, and the flange squeal uh, was more piercing and obnoxious than uh, my loud, obnoxious voice, which can be hard to do, but obviously for a freight train, it's a pretty easy task. Uh, the gentlemen on that train are probably going to be at work for another 10 hours. They're stuck in a can on a beautiful sunny day. I do not envy them. Anyway, back to talking about Penicetum cetaceum, that uh, invasive non-native uh, fountain grass. Uh, it's from the more uh, open exposed areas of uh, eastern Africa, you know. And uh, like many of the grasses, this is what's known as a C4 plant. That is, it engages in C4 photosynthesis. Now, 90% of the plants on planet Earth are C3 uh, photosynthetic plants. Uh, basically, the difference between the two 
has to do with the fact that there's an enzyme called rubisco which exists in the chloroplast cells of plants rubisco is the enzyme that is the first you know it basically plays a part in the first step of converting atmospheric carbon dioxide uh, the gas to uh, glucose the sugar molecule a more solid uh, and stable form of uh, of carbon which uh, the plant of course uses now that has to do with the whole photosynthetic process which could be kind of a pain in the ass to uh, wrap your head around uh, at least in the inner workings of it but the important point is is that in those uh, chloroplast cells uh, carbon dioxide the concentration tends to decrease at the uh, higher temperatures so rubisco can bond with carbon dioxide and it can also bond with oxygen now it's got more of a propensity to bond with uh, carbon dioxide However, uh, when the concentration of CO2, of carbon dioxide, in uh, one of those cells goes down, uh, which it does at high temperatures, rubisco tends to instead bond with oxygen, uh, known as a process called the photorespiration. Now, of course, that, uh, that's not, uh, not going to work. You know, in terms of converting CO2 to glucose, photorespiration kind of messes everything up. So, one of the ways that grasses from hotter climates cope with this is they started increasing the carbon dioxide concentration in their cells above what those 90 other 90 percent of other plants do to engage in c3 photosynthesis so they use it as c4 photosynthetic pathway instead now you can read more about this and it will probably do a better job of explaining it than i am but uh, it is important to know about c4 photosynthesis and again it's thought to be a relatively recent innovation uh, in the uh, evolution of plant life so there you go you can teach you something about life on earth just from standing on a bluff above the shitty train tracks looking at a non-native invasive grass which could be a very big pain in the ass down here in uh, Southern California. Oh well, look there's a little helicopter landed over there at the cop shop. How about that? Anyway here's another plant. Remember the same family as that found grass that Penicetum cetaceum. This is a plant known as giant reed. Another bad invasive. You catching a the theme here? A lot of the grasses are very successful at the uh, I guess it out-competing native plants, you know, in bioregions all over the world. Now, this guy's native to Asia, but he's all over the place. I mean, we get him up in filthy Oakland. We get him down in Mexico. You see him, uh, I've seen, seen this plant in Australia. And normally, it tends to thrive along waterways where there's enough water for it. But uh, uh, interestingly enough, this is not a C4 photosynthetic plant. This is C3 uh, photosynthetic. It uses the C3 uh, photosynthetic pathway, uh, but... Uh, it tends to be uh, very productive nonetheless, even at higher temperatures. So there you go, Rundo Donax can be a real bad invasive. Kind of got this nice bamboo look to it. You should see the clumps of this along the Rio Grande. I mean, it totally outcompetes uh, all the natives, forms a really pain in the ass uh, monoculture thicket, you know, because uh, apparently whatever keeps it in check in Asia doesn't exist uh, in, uh, in North America, you know, assuming that's a fungus or some sort of... Uh, insect probably an insect i don't know either way uh, like i said it could be a pain in the ass even though uh you know it's uh obviously uh thriving here uh in a disturbed area next to the la river you're so good you just patiently wait this is because i gave you that prosciutto yesterday huh oh now here's an old favorite everybody knows this at least if you uh, live in the midwest or the east coast or cities in that area this is uh, the tree of heaven ilanthus altissima in the simaru basin you can see i broke off a little uh, a little branch right there it does indeed smell pretty bad it kind of smells like uh, piss uh, anyway uh, this was brought over uh, I believe in the late 1700s, it was going to be used initially as a host plant for a species of silk moth, but of course, you know, it got loose, broke out, and uh, forms uh, monocultures, at least in areas where it gets enough rain. You can see it's not thriving too well here, but you take this to an area where they got summer rain, say, you know, Crook County, Illinois, or, you know, Philly, or New York, or any of those areas, and it, it, it takes off. A lot of uh, early uh, white settlers planted this. Uh, you know, you can still find it around uh, dead ghost towns out west, but it's struggling, man. I mean, it doesn't do that well, you know, like I said, unless you got the summer rain. Uh, it's dormant right now because it's the winter. It's a deciduous tree, uh, but when it comes out, it's got uh, almost uh, kind of ferny looking leaves. I mean, not to me because I know ferns, but if you didn't know plants that well, you might say that they were ferny. They're pinnate. Uh, the leaves smell absolutely like hell. You could see there's what the fruits look like. Just uh, you know, a bunch of seed heads. The seed is a, a Samara, kind of like an ash tree. You know, it's a winged seed. A real cool uh, member of the same family, though, 
does grow in the deserts. It's known as the crucifixion thorn, Castilla emorii. It's a stem photosynthesizer. It doesn't have any leaves, at least when it's an adult. And uh, it does look indeed like a crucifixion. Uh, uh, you know, one of the plants they use for the crucifixion ring or whatever the fuck. You know, when they put it on a Jesus, and they put it, threw him up on a cross, put one of those uh, 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 wreaths on him, a crown. You know, it kind of looks like that, little crown of thorns. Very beautiful plant. It's got bright orange fruits. And uh, it's thought that uh, that plant, Castilla emorii, uh, produces fruits that uh, co-evolved with an extinct species of megafauna. But of course, there's not really any way to test that theory, I guess, because you can't go back to the fucking Pleistocene. Anyway, there you go. I land this Altissima, Tree of Heaven, uh, the subject of the book of Tree Gross in Brooklyn, and a uh, uh, member of the Simaruba family. There you go. Uh, now look at it. There you go. There's a nice uh, palm tree. Now this is a pretty weedy palm it said uh, actually native uh, to an area somewhat uh, somewhat close by not too far away as the crow flies it's native uh, to western sonora mexico as well as baja california sir it is not uh, native uh, to the la basin or the region directly adjacent to it the mojave desert but native to the mojave desert there is a uh, native species of palm in the same genus as this this washingtonia filifera you can go see them where they reside in palm canyons uh, they basically grow at springs, and the seed is transported by birds and coyotes. But they only grow at the springs. They're not very uh, drought adapted. You know, they can't go too long without the, their at least the feet tapped into some water. Anyway, Washingtonia robusta comes up on the freeways uh, along the uh, shit and filth covered train tracks and gutters, and it can be pretty aggressive. Uh, you know, it doesn't really bother me too much because, again, it's, uh, it's not invasive from far away. That is, it's uh, somewhat close enough to this ecosystem to be here without fucking it up too bad. But uh, you could see it does thrive. I mean, this was obviously not planted. This is a, a, it's probably a seed shit up by a bird or who knows what the shit. Anyway, the difference between Washingtonia and uh, uh, Filifera and Washingtonia robusta, both are colloquially known as fan palms because the leaves look like fans, you know, as opposed to like a date palm, which looks more like a feather. The difference between them can be seen in uh, the hair state which is basically that little triangular area uh, where the, uh, the fan leaf meets the petiole, that is the leaf stock. Now you can see up there on that hair state, it's covered with that white fuzz with those trichomes. Washingtonia filifera does not have that, at least not on the abaxial side. Also look at those, look at the margins of those leaves, just covered in those aggressive ass spines. You know, and take it from me, I've been cut and stabbed with them many times, uh, they do hurt. They do hurt. You can see they're basically razor sharp and about an inch long. Anyway, there you go. Washingtonia robusta, the Mexican fan palm, doing fine uh, up here among uh, the garbage and the filth and whatnot. Holy shit, look at that. Here we have, coming up amongst the Russian thistle, a member of the Amaranthaceae family, not a true thistle at all. Here we have another native plant. Here we go, Datura radii, growing amongst the construction netting to, to prevent erosion, of course, and uh, all the... Uh, uh, probably a wealth of industrial pollutants uh, contaminating this soil. You can see it's not very big. These plants can get upwards of five feet wide, four feet tall, producing beautiful white trumpet flowers uh, that uh, I, I believe they tend to open at night, but then they remain open through the day. Uh, of course, here's the seed. You know, the, the high school kids used to eat these because uh, those seeds uh, contain some uh, hallucinogenic alkaloids, another member of the, the Solanaceae, the nightshade family here. Now, of course, uh, it's uh, been rumored that many of the uh, native uh, people of uh, Southern California would have a few of these seeds and go on a vision quest and what the shit and chisel into the rocks, leave some petroglyphs, whatever. However, I do not recommend it because though one seed might induce lucid dreams, more than one or two seeds uh, could very well kill you or send your ass on a, a terrible uh, memorable, but memorably terrible, a psychedelic trip. Anyway, there you go, Datura radii, you could see uh, it thrives in the hot and dry areas. It's covered in a nice indumentum of uh, uh, very tiny hairs. You know, and Datura is another big genus. They, I'm pretty sure they occur all over the world. I know we've seen some down in Chile. I even think you got a couple uh, native uh, species uh, in India right there. And again, this is very small. Actually, no, you know what? There it is. There's another one that's still alive, or that's dead. This is just one that's still alive. So you can see they get pretty big, but this is very small for the species. They're going to get a lot bigger. So it's either suffering uh, uh, from the industrial contamination or uh, just uh, germinated uh, relatively recently. Anyway, there you go. Datura radii. 
uh, it, it seems a construction project is in the works. Uh, they're probably building something terrible. I don't care to find out. Let's keep moving on down the tracks. Hey, see them tumbling down, pledging their love to the ground. Lonely but free, I'll be found. Drifting along with the tumbling, tumbling. Well, right, it's enough for that. Anyway, here you go. Here's the tumbleweed. It's a species in the genus Salsola amaranthaceae. Here it is, alive and kicking. Very prickly, spiny. Not a nice plant, but again, this whole thing can basically, once it's done uh, being uh, uh, pollinated and the seeds are mature and fertile, this whole goddamn mass of uh, one plant that could be two or three plants right there, the whole goddamn thing can basically uproot itself, well not itself, but it uh, weakens at the point uh, where the stem goes into the ground and the whole thing just de de hisses from the ground and just, well that's not a white way to say it anyway, the point I'm trying to say is the thing comes out of the ground and starts tumbling down the road, spreading seeds everywhere, you can see why it's so successful, I mean easily this plant has probably upwards of three or four thousand or five thousand seeds in it and when you get that thing moving in a good windstorm you know it just basically it could spread seed all the way down to that uh, that the uh, railroad bridge uh, way down there so there you go tumbleweeds not native uh it's known as the russian thistle is another uh, common uh, name for it but uh, you know they're uh, pretty ubiquitous across uh, the north american west very interesting, uh, it looks like a schist here, well that appears to be uh, some sort of diorite, but over there that definitely is some schist, looks pretty good too, oh yeah look at that, that might even be a nice, you know, not even gonna fuck with that pun, anyway, that's pretty nice, you know, I can still get some good geology, uh, get some good geology here even in uh, the middle of the city, I wonder where they sourced their ballast from, probably somewhere uh, uh, east of here in the Mojave Desert. Oh yeah, look at it. It could even be it could even be a pigment though. You got some nice uh, horn blend and uh, mica minerals in there. How about that? <laughs> and of course, it wouldn't be industrial decay without the slag. Oh, this looks like it's some especially toxic slag. I wonder what's causing that nice sheen on it. I should probably put that down and wash my hands. Oh, look at it, coming up uh, right by the greaser, which puts the grease on a, the train tracks so that when they're going around these tight curves, it uh, doesn't uh, lead to too much wear and tear on those very expensive uh, uh, one-ton wheels that you see. Anyway, coming up right near the greaser, we have another cool native plant, a member of the sunflower family Asteraceae. This is a species of Brichelia. Looks like Brichelia californica. And just by smelling it, you rub my fingers around, I can smell it. Uh, I can tell it's... Uh, it is indeed a Brichelia. There's no flowers, you know. Uh, it, they have discoid flowers, but uh, even just seeing that leaf shape, the branching structure, and of, uh, the connescence on the uh, stem, as well as the smell. The smell's the biggest giveaway. It does smell kind of pleasant. It doesn't smell that pleasant. It smells a little bad, but it sm it's kind of pleasant, though. Anyway, a uh, Brichelia coming up right here. Only one I've seen. You know, right next to the uh, Russian thistle and the uh, fountain grass or whatever the shit. Cool. It's always cool to see natives thriving in, uh, you know, the, the bleak railroad infrastructure and whatnot. Jeez. It looks like somebody died. It appears to be a dog. Oh, now look at that. Scenery of America's future. Uh, unclimbable fencing topped by razor wire. That, that fountain grass is kind of pretty. Oh, hey, look at that. Oh, look at that. The river's moving pretty swift right now. It's a nice color, huh? <laughs> looks looks like, uh, you know, after somebody clogs the toilet bowl, you know, and you give it a few tries with the plunger to try and make the turd go down, but you're not 100% successful, that's kind of what that, uh, it's kind of what that looks like. Amazing they're actually uh, painting over the graffiti along the river, too. L.A. River used to have some beautiful graffiti on it. A lot of nice looking stuff, you know what I mean? It already looks like shit anyway. I don't know why... They, you know, it's like, not like it's going to matter if you got a, you know, some uh, some kids spray painting some stuff up there. Anyway, over there you can see is uh, Mission Tower. Uh, I don't believe there's anybody in that tower right now, but railroad towers used to always be staffed back in the day. They were uh, an essential part of railroad infrastructure. There'd be a little guy in there, you know, with uh, about 30 or 40 levers, interlocking levers, all controlling the switches that dictated which curve uh, or straightaway uh, the trains would take. You know, and the idea was that if you locked one of them, you could not lock the other, 
you know, the opposing one, so you couldn't line two trains into each other. But, you know, people being people, they always find a way to fuck it up. Anyway, a lot of those towers are gone now. We used to have some real beautiful ones in Oakland. There was one down by the Adelang Street overpass. There was a Magnolia Tower. Uh, they still got the 16th Street Tower, but I think it's filled with bum shit. And, uh, you know, they, there were a multitude of towers all over the former Southern Pacific lines. But uh, most are gone. Cool to see they still got that one up. Now, when I was a young man, I used to fancy hanging out around areas like this railroad infrastructure, power line easements, the same place that the many of the urban coyotes hang out because it was a nice place to get away from people. You could find, uh, you know, solitude and silence and relative calm amongst the... Uh, Jesus Christ. Amongst all the wacky shit going on around you in uh, today's urban environment. Now, today, of course, I prefer to get the fuck out of cities altogether, but... Uh, you know, they're legally required by law to do that, so I don't know why people get pissed off about it. It's not like it's the poor bastard's fault who's driving a fucking train, excuse me, running the locomotive. They're legally required by law, especially in California, state law, you gotta blow. I don't know why people get pissed at that. We used to get people throwing shit at us in the train, whatever. Anyway, uh, you know, this was always a nice place to hang out. Places like this, you know, you go to, you go to Chicago, you go to Philly, you go to New York, no matter where you go, the railroads, and uh, the power line easements and the vacant lots and uh, the abandoned buildings, always a nice place to hang out, uh, at least if you're coming uh, from the same perspective I am. Nowadays, I just go to the mountains and the deserts, but uh, if you wanted freedom and peace and calm back then, that was the spot to go. Anyway, hey, we're going to take a little look at this plant over here, another uh, pretty weedy native plant. And by weedy, I just mean it's aggressive. And thank God for that, because it's able to be uh, pretty successful uh, in a highly disturbed environment. You know, the train tracks, the railroad actually sprays uh, all kinds of uh, uh, chemicals along the tracks to discourage weeds. They probably glyphosate, the uh, triclo, whatever the fuck that's called. You know, there's a, a wealth of, uh, again, very toxic industrial pollutants that the railroad pays to make sure that the, the weeds don't... Uh, grow too close to the train tracks so uh, this ground is probably laced with it and despite that you still get a uh, quite a few plants able to tolerate it and uh, thrive despite it this is heterotheca grandiflora another uh, southwest uh, united states native plant uh, you can obviously see it's in the sunflower family look at those nice ligules those daisy rays here's what the filaries look like now whenever you're looking at plants that look like a daisy don't just take a picture if you're trying, at least if you're trying to figure out what the shit it is. Don't just take a picture like that, you know. If you're, especially if you're going to be sending it to me or someone out or any other botanist to ask you to ID what the shit you're looking at. You always want to look at those filaries, okay. And those are those little roof and shingle like bricks. Those little pointed spiky bricks that are all, uh, you know, flattened against that involucre uh, and occur in a series. Uh, the filaries are diagnostic in many species of uh, the sunflower family. Okay, of course you want to look and see if it's got ligules or not. If it doesn't have ligules, it's discoid, of course. You want to see if it's got filaries. Look at how, this is a very glandular plant too. Look at how uh, shiny uh, my fingertip is just from touching this bastard. It actually smells pretty good too, you know. It smells a little bit like cannabis uh, with the, maybe a hint of lemon. Anyway, uh, get up if, if you were to get up close and look at this under a, a, you know, a 10x hand lens or something, a jeweler's loop, you could see all those glands. Anyway, uh, who knows what uh, compounds are in uh, in those glands? Oh, Jesus Christ! Who knows what compounds are in those glands? Probably meant to discourage insects and herbivory. Uh, anyway, Heterotheca grandiflora. There you go. Ah, the scenic uh, East Diamond Y. Now, 20 years ago, this used to be the spot to wait if you wanted to bag a train out of LA. Say you've been hanging out at the library for a couple hours. You know, you had some good coffee. You used to be the spot your way. To catch a train that would then take you northwards towards San Luis Obispo and whatnot, and it was a, a pretty interesting uh, paradox because you'd be here among all the homeless camps and human shit, and uh, you know every day I don't know around four or five p.m. taking this uh, curve right here, there used to be a uh, what we would call a junk train, a manifest train with a lot of open box cars on it. You'd bag one of those, and uh, you know an hour later you're rolling along the beach looking at desolate beach. And uh, you know, on one side and rich people's uh, uh, mansion estates on the other side. Uh, only place, I believe this is the only line uh, on planet Earth, the only railroad line where you could actually see whales from a freight train. Uh, anyway, that train uh, doesn't exist anymore. Uh, they canceled it. It doesn't come true here. 
the whole line in fact is pretty much abandoned for freight traffic at least the coast route that goes through San, San Luis Obispo and I shouldn't even be telling you this because of course I gotta put the obvious disclaimer in there uh, riding, uh, riding freight trains is illegal in fact doing what I'm doing right now is also highly illegal uh, but it's uh, uh, for the interest of botany so I talked to them and they said it's fine anyway uh, moving right along uh, here we go you can see the tree tobacco, the Nicotiana Glock is having a fine time over here. There's a little castor plant, and of course, a horticultural atrocity, but a beautiful one nonetheless. Here we have uh, Bougainvillea, a member of the four o'clock family. Nictaginaceae, another plant uh, family that's highly successful in North American deserts. Interesting uh, thing about this family is that the flowers don't have true petals. They have uh, what you could call petaloid sepals. So we'll get up close and take a look at this. There you go. There's the individual flowers of uh, Bougainvillea. Now this plant, of course, is native to Brazil and Peru. Uh, but again, it, uh, being a horticultural atrocity, uh, it is commonly overplanted. And uh, I got the holding the, the little bracts open right there. So those red things right there are technically not sepals or petals. Uh, they are just, uh, I guess you just call them bracts. You know, and a lot of plants do that. Euphorbias uh, produce bracts. They're basically just leaf-like structures, sterile leaf-like structures that uh, subtend the individual flowers. And again, that white part, those aren't even petals because Nictaginaceae technically doesn't have petals. They have petaloid, that is, they look like petal, petals, sepals. They have petaloid sepals. So there you go. There's a couple, there's two that didn't open yet, and there's one uh, open. You can see it's uh, even got some spines on it. It's some tiny spines. Anyway, again, horticultural atrocity, heavily overplanted. But the hummingbirds uh, seem to like it, uh, and uh, you know it does it, it does well here. Oh, okay, here you go. Here's a member of the mango and poison oak and cashew family, Anacardiaceae. This one's native to Chile and Argentina. Uh, this is Shinus polygamus. Now, the genus Shinus is a very common horticultural atrocity you encounter here in California, especially next to the freeways. They're known colloquially as the pepper trees, and uh, oftentimes uh, the, another one of these species can be a rather large tree with little uh, kind of pearly pink uh, fruits on it and whatnot. This one uh, doesn't get that big, and uh, you know, you can see it's uh, obviously naturalized here. It doesn't tend to form monocultures, but uh, it is uh, uh, mildly obnoxious, and it, uh, like I said, it does reseed itself. Anyway, the big giveaway here, since it's lacking flowers and fruits, the big giveaway in diagnosing what the hell species this is, uh, is uh, it basically comes down to looking at the venation of those leaves. You can see you got a, a prominent the primary vein right there, somewhat raised above the rest of the leaf layer, and then you got those secondary veins, both of which are a, a lighter green color than the rest of the leaf. And of course, the leaves are kind of glabrous, kind of glabrous and waxy, and then on that stem, you got just the uh, slightest indumentum. Many, uh, many species in the, the Anacardiaceae, the poison oak and mango family, uh, produce, uh, uh, you know, allergenic reactions in those who touch them or consume them. Let's hope it's not the case with this one. I don't think it is. But, uh, you know, like, like I said, a lot of those uh, compounds, Eurushiol, in the case of poison oak, are produced in this family, Anacardiaceae. Anyway, there you go. Shinus polygamus, uh, one of the pepper trees. So uh, I should probably get out of here, uh, you know, uh, there might be a chance my truck no longer has wheels on it, and uh, also uh, the guys over there working probably called the cops on me, so it's time to dip out. Anyway, the moral of the story is, is that uh, even in a toilet, there's a little bit of light, and you can go out there and learn about the world around you, the non-human world, the real, real world, and uh, figure out what's going on, you know, what are you looking at the... Uh, uh, bugs or fucking leaves or whatever it's all a pleasant escape and a much healthier one than drinking yourself to death uh, from the depressing reality anyway like i said i gotta dip out uh you never know who's gonna roll up and uh, maybe cite me so uh anyway have a nice rest of your evening go fuck yourself and goodbye